If you're looking to start a pressure washing business, you have found the right video. My goal is to give you as much information as possible in this one and cover all the essentials that you're going to need in order to start your pressure washing business. In this one, I'm going to go over licensing and insurance equipment, how to get your first customer, and then how to get enough customers to sustain your business. Then we'll cover how to quote jobs, and I'll have some really good bonus tips for anybody who wants to stick around until the end of the video. We're also giving away this truck along with a mini skid from Southeast Softwash to a premium or platinum subscriber of Quote IQ. So if you need help keeping up with customers, sending estimates, invoices or collecting payments, check out Quota Q linked in the comment section and the description of this video. Also, if you're looking to start a pressure washing business, but you're not sure what chemicals to use, how to mix them, how to clean every surface on a residential job site, property protection, or how to set up your equipment, check out the how to wash course. It'll be the first link in the comment section and the description. But let's go ahead and get into this one. So first things first, you're going to need licensing and insurance. So you're going to want to go to your local city court and get a business license. If you don't know where it is, you can probably just Google it. Um, you can structure this however you want, depending on how serious you are. You may want to consult a tax professional like if you're thinking about optimizing it for an s corp but generally an llc is a great business structure for anybody who's looking to get a, a business started this business entity will actually protect you in the event that anyone ever tries to sue you which is one of the most powerful benefits of having an llc that and you can also insure it uh, you want to be sure that you are protected by a business entity in the event that you are sued they could technically go after all your personal assets so if i sued someone who came and cleaned my property and they didn't have a business license or an llc or something in place then i technically could go after everything that they have in their bank account so typically this process just involves you know filling out some paperwork with all your business information and then you can go ahead and get it filed and you'll get processed in with the state next you're going to want to check in with your city county or parish to be sure that you don't need any specific permits in order to start your pressure washing business now different places across the country have different requirements so that's why I said check with them. So once you've taken care of that, the next step is going to be to get insurance. I will have a link below to a free insurance quote and get insured in as little as 10 minutes. Now, I will say this. If you go locally or if you find a local insurance provider, they will probably be cheaper. However, it will be less convenient. I'm offering you a button that you can click. You can fill it out and get a free insurance quote. However, if you want to you know, search online, find another insurance provider, find someone locally. You guys can do that as well. But the next step is just to get insurance. So if you want a quick quote, check it out down below. I'll leave a link. Um, however, like I mentioned before, it will probably be cheaper if you find someone locally. Next, let's go ahead and get into the equipment section. Now, we'll have a link below as well for an Amazon store that's going to have more equipment than I'm going to even be able to think about in this video. So everything mentioned in this video will be in the Amazon store. However, First things first, if we're starting a pressure washing business, we probably need a pressure washer. So I recommend everybody go out to Lowe's and get your pressure washer for a couple of different reasons. A, they're cheap. B, if you figure you don't want to do this business anymore, you can always return it. Now, if you go through like Amazon to get your pressure washer, it's going to be a little bit harder to return. Lowe's doesn't typically ask any questions. Also, whenever you buy a pressure washer through Lowe's, you can get a warranty. If anything ever happens to that pressure washer within the warranty, I've had this happen before. I'll just bring the pressure washer in and they'll exchange it out for one that they have on the shelf so that's something that you cannot do on amazon so if you're looking to get a pressure washer you're just starting your business you don't know if this is necessarily something that you're going to do long term i would highly recommend just going to lowe's you can get a decent pressure washer from about 250 to 500 dollars, but you could probably get like the highest end pressure washer that lowe's sells uh, for about a thousand dollars maybe a little bit more um, so with regards to pressure washers two and a half gallon per minute to four gallon per minute is going to be best for beginners i wouldn't go anything lower than two and a half i know i've seen washers that are like 1.8 or whatever those are typically electric washers which i'm going to talk about here in just a second but two and a half to four gallon per minute is probably going to be best for you also the range for psi anywhere between 2500 to 4000 is going to be um, a good psi range for you there's a misconception out there amongst a lot of people and that is that the higher the psi the better the washer is and ultimately psi does not matter because we'll not be we won't be using pressure in order to clean most of the services that we're going to be cleaning so the pounds per square inch really doesn't matter essentially if you clean the services the correct way you can wash them off with a garden hose and they would be good but just pressure washers are good for things like concrete however if we're cleaning like stucco or we're cleaning like vinyl siding you don't want to be hitting those with 4,000 pounds of pressure next the pressure tips on your washer are going to be what controls the water pressure this was something that i didn't know for a very long time i was always curious why they put so many different wash tips or they gave me so many different wash tips whenever they gave me my pressure washer the smaller the degree on the tip the more pressure pressure is going to be produced with that tip. So as soon as you get your pressure washer, take the red tip and go ahead and throw it in the trash can. That is a zero degree tip and it shoots like a straight line. If you hit somebody's house with a zero degree tip and a 4,000 
PSI pressure washer, you will cause damage. So just go ahead and throw that one away. I would recommend using the white and the yellow ones. Those were the ones that I always use most. They have a good spread on them, uh, but it's not going to be too much pressure. You can also get a thing called a J-Rod, which I'm going to talk about here in just a few minutes, but basically that's going to have like a shooter tip, a fan tip. It's going to have pretty much everything that you're going to need, and you can find that at southeastsoftwash.com. Now, I wouldn't recommend going with anything electric with regards to your pressure washer. I mentioned this earlier because it's going to create unnecessary hurdles for yourself with cords, and also it's going to look kind of unprofessional if you're trying to haul around this little pressure washer with cords around somebody's house. Just my opinion, of course, do whatever you have to do to get started. If all you had was access to, you know, an electric pressure washer, I know plenty of uh, mobile detailers that use electric pressure washers. However, they're not having to haul them around the house. So it is a little bit different. I'm just letting you know that if you do get one, it will be a pain. It will be a little bit unprofessional. And of course, water and electricity never mix. So I wouldn't want to create any instances where I could, you know, combine those two, especially at someone else's property. So I don't recommend electric pressure washers. Um, anything over four gallons per minute, as far as what the pressure washer is rated, rated for, uh, you're going to need a water tank. So that's why I recommend Lowe's in the beginning, because if you're needing to put a water tank on, you're going to need a couple of other components that are going to make it uh, more costly, something like a trailer and just some other pieces. So I recommend anything under four gallons per minute. Typically, people's spigots are rated from three to four gallons per minute, and that's why if you use anything over that, you need a higher flow than what the spigot will allow, and essentially your, your machine is going to need to pull more water than what the spigot will give it. So that's why you need... Um, that's why you need a buffer tank, something that kind of allows you to pull more water as you need it. Next, let's talk about surface cleaners. Uh, you could buy surface cleaners at Lowe's. However, I would not recommend doing this at all. I bought so many surface cleaners. They would get rocks stuck in the um, holes very quickly and they would get clogged up and they would break and it just wasn't a good, I didn't have a good experience with Lowe's um, surface cleaners. I would go with something more expensive, which I will link to, like I said, in the equipment store down below. You guys can get a BE service cleaner. You can get a Whirl Away service cleaner. Those are two really good brands. You also want to go with something more expensive because it's going to last you longer, right? Like you don't want to be going in Lowe's every other day to exchange out your little service cleaner that you got. You also want to make sure that you don't go too big with the service cleaner. You might think, oh, well, I'm going to go with the biggest one they have because it's going to allow me to clean faster. That's not necessarily the truth because basically the lower the flow rate that you have, the smaller the service cleaner that you should be using. Because if you have a two and a half gallon a minute pressure washer and you try to use like a 30 some odd inch uh, service cleaner, there's not going to be enough flow to really like spin that wheel and, and clean the concrete so you're gonna have to be moving incredibly slow so the lower the flow rate on your machine the smaller the service cleaner that you're going to need 16 inches would be great uh, for a starter pressure washer even if you have a two and a half gallon a minute still probably go with the 16 inch basically the rule of thumb with regards to service cleaners and pressure washers is it's four inches for every gallon per minute so four gallons per minute four inches equals 16, four times four, anybody who's not good at math, 16 inches should be good. Um, so that's what I would recommend. If your service cleaner isn't spinning, you're going to want to check the tips. That can happen sometimes, uh, you know, little debris or little rocks get clogged up into the tips and you have to take those off and wash them out. That's something that I messed up on early. Like I said, that's why I didn't like using low service cleaners. They would get clogged up and then I'd be like, you know, what's the deal? So anyway, make sure that you check your tips. If it's not spinning, four inches for every gallon per minute and you're going to be good to go with your service cleaner. Next, let's go ahead and get into chemical application. Now there's a bunch of different ways that you can apply chemical. Whenever you're first starting out though, um, some of the best ways are like a pump up sprayer from Lowe's, which is going to take you a long time, but it still works. It's still effective. You also have a downstreamer, which typically comes with a lot of washers, which connects to your washer and it downstreams chemical from a bucket um, to basically the end of the line where it's dispersed. The other thing that you can get is an X jet, which is my preferred method. I just like X jets. I think they work good. I like them. Um, it does a good job. It always pulls the bleach and it doesn't have anything to do with my washer. They also shoot really far too. So that's another benefit of X jets, but basically the X jet connects to the end of the wand and a hose runs down into a bucket where it pulls the chemical and you can basically change out your little proportioners to uh, whatever strength bleach that you want, but we're going to talk about bleach here in just a minute. So chemical applicators, pump up sprayer, downstreamer, X jet. Next, let's talk about just equipment extras, things that you're going to need. First and foremost is going to be a ball valve. A ball valve is going to allow you to connect your gun to your pressure hose and then swap between the gun and the service cleaner, which is incredibly valuable. We can also rinse with the ball valve. You need a ball valve. They're cheap. They're like 25, 40 bucks, something like that. Check it out in the store down below. We have ball valves down there. You're going to need one. The next thing is a garden hose to connect to the customer's water supply. We'll talk about water supply here in just a minute. But basically, 
you need a garden hose, you want to bring your garden hose, I wouldn't trust someone else's garden hose, I would bring my own. The next thing is a J-Rod, um, we talked about this with regards to the tips, um, it has multiple tips for soft washing, like I said, it's got a shooter tip, it's got a fan tip, it might have a couple more tips depending on which one you get, but you can check out J-Rods, those will be in the store down below as well, so that way you don't have to swap between the colored ones, you can just use those, and those are essential for um, soft washing. Uh, the next thing is gas cans, you're going to need gas cans, it's something that you know some people may forget whenever they're you know setting up their equipment but this equipment runs on gas and you need gas unless you're going with an electric washer and then lastly you need pressure washer hose i would get at least 100 feet if you buy a pressure washer from lowe's or home depot it's only going to come with about 50 feet of pressure hose i would get one that's longer because basically the longer the pressure hose the less you're going to have to be moving that machine around the yard and trust me when it's hot and you're sweaty and the job's taking longer than you expected and things aren't going the right way, you're not going to want to be pulling that machine around the yard. So get, I would say, at least 100 feet of pressure hose. Like I said, check out the store in the comment section and the description. Next, let's go ahead and talk about a chemicals. Um, this is going to be the essentials with regards to chemicals, the basics. I did a collab video with Cody from Southeast Softwash doing a beginner chemical guide where we went through every single chemical that his company offers as well as every single chemical that you're going to need in order to make upsells and basically offer every single add-on service that you can. So definitely check out that video. I'll try to leave that link down below as well. But the most important chemical that you're going to need is bleach. Uh, it's also referred to as sodium hypochlorite or SH. And basically you can get this in a couple different ways. You can get it from a pool store in a container. Uh, there's bleach providers if you have like a tank that you can fill up um, i would recommend like pinch a penny that's where you can get some good bleach typically it's like a 12 percent um, but just know that it degrades you can also get it in pool essentials at walmart that's another way that you can get your bleach uh, just make sure that you're using bleach basically what it does is it's going to kill off all the organics at the property this is essentially what soft washing is it's first a chemical treatment that kills off all the organics on all the different services with a low pressure rinse in order to uh, rinse off all those services from those pollutants essentially and that's why we don't use pressure because pressure can damage things using bleach is going to allow us to kill off the organics and rinse those without damaging anything at the property now with regards to the bleach you'll also need to mix it with water uh, you'll need to know the percentages and ranges based on whatever services that you're cleaning uh, within quote iq we have a mix ratio chart for the different types of services so it's going to tell you exactly what your ratio needs to be in order to properly clean those services as well as we have a mix calculator which is free within the app so if you download the app, you go to the mix calculator section, you're going to be able to input, you know, if you have a five gallon bucket and let's say you're mixing 12% bleach and you want to get a 1%, it's going to tell you exactly how much bleach to water ratio you're going to need in order to achieve that. So if you need help with mixing your chemicals, definitely check out Quota Q, link down below. Um, surfactants and soaps is another thing that you're going to need. More so if you're cleaning roofs, however, uh, it's going to allow the bleach to stick to the surfaces that you're applying it to. It's also going to cover the scent of the bleach, which may be a complaint of some of your customers. I've heard some of my customers say, you know, it smells like a pool store out here. They'll make little comments about how strong the bleach smells. If you don't want that, use a surfactant, use a soap whenever you're uh, mixing your cleaning solutions. Just make sure you don't mix too much in there. If you mix too much soap in your bleach mixture, then it's really bad. It streaks up windows and it makes it a lot harder to rinse, especially if you're using a good surfactant. Now, if you guys need a good surfactant, check out southeastsoftwash.com. I recommend they have two different, I want to say flavors. They have two different smells. They have a southern draw and they have another, I think, lemon scent. Uh, either way, it's going to cover the scent of the bleach and it's going to help that sh stick so that way it can kill off all the organic stains lastly with regards to chemicals that we're going to cover in this video you have specialty stain removers so you have like oil stains which can be removed with degreaser rust stains gutter streak stains graffiti stains like i mentioned before in the video that me and cody did with the beginner chemical guide we go over all the chemicals that you're going to need to treat all of those different stains but if you guys want to go to southeastsoftwash.com all the chemicals for every stain that you could ever treat is pretty much uh, on that website so I highly recommend you guys check that out. These provide for great add-on services to raise your average ticket price, which we're going to get to a little bit later in this video. Next, let's go ahead and cover marketing. So free leads from Google is the best. I used to have my mindset on Facebook. I was like, Facebook is the best. Facebook is the best. However, 
The downside to Facebook is you have to spend money in order to acquire customers. With Google, you do not. So what you want to do is you want to start your Google My Business early. As soon as you decide that you're going to start a pressure washing business, I would go to, uh, I think it's a Google business profile now, but I'd Google that. I'd set up your Google business profile. You can set up your listing for your house. You don't have to have like a commercial address in order to do it. You can run it from your home since it is a service business. And I would also recommend you set up your website as early as possible. This is going to help you in the long run to get those free leads from Google uh, that you ultimately want because free leads are just going to be free fuel to our business essentially. And if you need a website builder, I will leave a link for the people who build my website, build Aaron's website, build Cody's website, and build Mike's website uh, down in the comment section and the description. They do an excellent job. Everyone in the inner circle has this uh, website builder and I actually have a special deal down below that's going to save you $600 a year uh, if you end up going with them as well as if you check out the site they have a bunch of additional information uh, that's going to help you guys know exactly what kind of stuff that they're providing they do all kind of stuff that I would never even want to touch or learn about um, so I just highly recommend you guys find somebody to do your website because the free leads on Google are essential next Facebook ads is my second favorite essentially because I love Facebook ads. I'm really good at running them. I'm really good at getting customers from them. I've landed $10,000 plus dollar jobs off of Facebook ads and um, I've just done really well with those. So learn how to run some good Facebook ads. You're going to get a bunch of customers. Also, you can try flyers. Whenever you're first starting out, you really want to rely on sweat equity over some of the other digital forms of marketing or forms of marketing that are going to cost you money because what we lack in money early on, we can make up for in effort. So flyers are a good way to go. I used to pass out a neighborhood a day until I'd get jobs and then I'd do those jobs and then I'd just hit a neighborhood a day until I got more jobs. And so with flyers, it's about getting in front of them multiple times. It's about using that sweat equity. And it's basically how I started. Another way that you can go is clip flyers, which you put a clip on a flyer and you throw it out the window. I highly don't recommend this because I consider it littering and I hate anyone who clip flyers my house or clip flyers. I just don't like it. Uh, the other ones that you can go with are um, yard signs. Uh, you can use other apps like Craigslist Next Door, let go Facebook groups to kind of solicit your business in there. Uh, you could try some door knocking, which is a very powerful method. I know a lot of people that got a lot of business very quickly door knocking and offering their services. I've done uh, videos where I talked about different scripts that you can use when door knocking. I will tell you this before I go on to the next one. One of the biggest things that you're going to want to do is leverage the fact that you've been in the neighborhood, that you've done work for so-and-so down the street, and that you're offering a special deal uh, since you're already here today. So, couple different things you need to act on with regards to door knocking, but it's very powerful to get jobs very quickly. And then lastly, you, know, you got word of mouth. There's tons and tons of ways you guys can get business and tons of different strategies that I've made videos on on my channel. The biggest thing is, is you want to find a handful of things and you want to execute them day after day after day after day. And you want to be consistent with them because what gets measured gets improved. And you want to make sure you're measuring where all these leads are coming from, which is something you can do within Quote IQ. Um, but basically with regards to your marketing, you want to stay consistent over time. Leverage sweat equity in the beginning to make up for what you don't have in money. Pass out flyers, yard signs, door hangers, whatever you got to do. And then later on, once you start making some money back from jobs, then start reinvesting that money back into paid ads in order to scale your business. And that's going to be the best marketing formula that I can give you in this video. Next, let's go ahead and talk about quoting. So there's basically two ways that you can quote. Firstly, you can quote based upon square footage. So you can measure out the property, you can measure out the home, you can measure out the driveway, the roof, the fence, whatever it is that you're quoting them on, um, which is basically the essence of what quote IQ is. It allows you to easily measure properties and create estimates within minutes. And if you're not sure exactly what to charge uh, per square foot within quote IQ, we actually have a sheet that'll show you the industry standards for square footage pricing. So if you need help coming up with like ballpark numbers on what your square foot prices should be, and I would give you mine, but it really varies from where you're at. It varies depending on where you're located, what your population size is, how much competition you have, um, and a bunch of different factors, right? Like the cost of living in Louisiana is much different than the cost of living in New York City or California. So my square footage price is going to be much, much different than somebody who's in New York or California or in areas with more dense populations or more jobs or less competition. So all those variants kind of get taken into um, consideration whenever you're trying to dictate whatever your square footage pricing should be. Another way that you can do it is quote based off of time. So how long would this job take me? Multiply by whatever it is that I want to make an hour. Whenever I was working for a landscape company, I was making $10 an hour. So for me, if I was making like $20 or $30 an hour, that was really good. So I would just take a job. I'd say, I think this is going to take me about four hours multiplied times $30. I'm going to charge $120. So that's essentially another 
another way that you can go about pricing. And if you want to take it a step further, you can use the cost calculator within Quad IQ, which is going to help you to generate an hourly rate based on all of the costs that you have and how much of a profit margin that you'd like to make. We included this within Quad IQ because we know that an hourly rate is one of the ways that people quote and not knowing your numbers is a great way to not be charging um, according to what you need to be charging. So definitely check that out if you're interested, but just keep in mind that there's no one way to quote and there's no such thing as a perfect quote. You want to always be learning. You want to always kind of be adapting your quote based on a couple different factors, which we're going to talk about here next, because you are going to underquote and you are going to basically overquote. You basically want to find a balance. So how do we dial in this pricing and find the balance? First and foremost, we want to adjust price based upon our conversion rate and our lead flow. This is another reason why we put the close ratio calculation on the dashboard of Quote IQ, because close ratio is a perfect metric to help you determine and dial in on what your pricing should be. So you can also do this with lead flow. For example, let's say that you have a low lead flow. You're going to have to charge a low price. And if you have a low conversion rate, which means if I send out 10 estimates and I'm only getting two people, I need to lower my price in order to convert more of those people. And on the other end of that, if you have a high lead flow, you can obviously charge more because we can afford to lose some of those customers. And if you have a high conversion rate, we need to be raising our prices because we don't want our conversion rate too high. I would say a good place to be is probably about 60%. You want to land more jobs than you lose, but you also don't want to land every single job because it is an indication that you're charging not enough. So you want to be conscious of these numbers. And that's why we put it in quote IQ, you can measure your close ratio and you can kind of determine where your pricing is at depending upon how many jobs you're landing on how many jobs that you're quoting. So low lead flow, lower price, low conversion rate, lower the price, higher lead flow, higher price, higher conversion rate, you need to raise your price. Now let's talk about how to grow our customer base. We want to work our inner circle first and make every single person aware that we have a business essentially. This is something that's very important. They teach you in real estate to text and call every single person within your contact list and let them know that you're in real estate and that you're able to do business for them. This is something that you need to do whenever you're first starting out because if you think about how many jobs you could potentially get just by the people that you know, it'd be a great way to get your business started and get your business going because every person that you know lives somewhere and every person that you know works somewhere and all those places need to be cleaned. The next thing that we can do is we can do jobs for cheap or free in the beginning uh, in order to get reviews and before and after picks. I highly recommend this because in the beginning, you don't know how to operate your equipment effectively. You don't really know chemicals. You don't really know how to charge. You don't really know how long anything is going to take you. So I do my house. I do my friends and family's houses and I do just a couple people's houses for free just to get an just to get an idea of some of these numbers as well as to get those before and after picks that I'm gonna need in order to start advertising. Now if you guys need before and after picks, we do sell a hundred before and after pick pack of like some of our best before and after picks. I'll try to leave a link for that down below as well. But you can do this by doing your first couple jobs for free and taking some great before and after picks. Also to grow your customer base, you want to use an app like Quote IQ to keep track of every single customer that you get and follow up with these people consistently to offer them other services or to reservice their property, okay? You don't want to lose the customers that you service because those people cost you money, those people cost you time, those people cost you energy in order to acquire and to build trust and build a relationship with. So you want to make sure that you're keeping all those people in one one place. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I made early on in my business. I didn't keep track of anything. I didn't know where any of my customers were. I just kind of would pass out flyers until I got jobs. And then I would do those jobs. And then if the customer messaged me a year from then to do another job, I was like, okay, great. But if not, they were gone. And I had to do more work and more energy and more walking and more passing out flyers and more running ads in order to acquire more customers, which basically was just a waste of my time and energy when I could have just kept track of everybody that I had serviced previously. You can also lower your customer acquisition costs by keeping existing customers. For example, if you had enough customers to fill a year, you'd never have to spend another dollar or pass out another flyer again because you could pretty much just reservice those people every single year. Lastly, in order to grow our customer base, you want to leverage every single job that you get to acquire more customers. Um, so you want to leverage those people's friends and family. You want to get testimonials. You want to get before and after picks. You want to go door knock after you, you know, do those people's property and say, hey, we just did so-and-so's property down the street. Do everything that you can to leverage the people that you do jobs for because word of mouth, social proof, those are all really good things in order to grow your customer base. Now let's get into some additional tips for anybody who stayed until the end. I really appreciate you if you stayed until the end. First and foremost, diversify your advertising. Don't rely solely on one source. As we mentioned earlier in the beginning, 
pass out the flyers, yard signs, door hangers, things of that nature. Then we want to start relying on some other free lead sources like Google websites once we've kind of built and established those. And then lastly, we want to reinvest on all of our jobs back into our ad spend so that we can multiply and scale our business because ads are the only way to scale. If I was able to give you a box right now that you could put a dollar into and every time you put a dollar into it, it would return $5, you'd never stop putting money into this box. So you kind of want to follow a little bit of a formula with regards to acquiring those customers. But one of the key things is to diversify. A lot of people rely solely on one source of getting their customers like word of mouth or Facebook or whatever be diversified. Don't rely solely on one source. Next tip that's going to really help you out is if you're having trouble getting customers for pressure washing, you want to find small services that are under marketed and can get your foot in the door with customers who wouldn't have known about you otherwise. Such services could be like can cleaning, gutter cleaning, maybe window washing, things that are just under marketed within the sphere of Facebook or wherever it is that you're doing your marketing. So that way, it's a lower ticket service. There's less risk for the customer. You can build that rapport with them, build that relationship with them, and ultimately you can get their business to do bigger projects. I've told this story a bunch of times, but I was running a can cleaning ad one time. This lady converted on it. She wanted to get her cans clean, her house wash, her roof wash, and her driveway cleaned. And we ended up doing the whole thing for like $1,500 and we threw in the cans for free at the end. If I wouldn't have been running the ad for can cleaning, I probably would not have gotten that $1,500 job. So you want to find small services that are under marketed to get your foot in the door with customers that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Next, you want to find upsells in every quote that you do to raise your average ticket price because you want to take full advantage of every single customer that comes through the door. Like I said, check out that chemical guide for beginners. There's going to be so many different little things that you can do. You can do red clay stain removal. You can do um, oil stain removal. Any stain on a customer's property can be treated and cleaned. But other things, like I mentioned with the little niche services, you can offer gutter cleaning. You can offer window washing. You can offer gutter brush. Brightening. There's a bunch of little add-on services. So make sure that you're finding these little services that you can add on to raise the average ticket price. This is another thing that's beneficial about quoting in person. You can see things as you're walking the property with the homeowner. You can ask them, hey, I see this is dirty. Did you want to include that in the quote? And so that's another good thing. The next one is you want to follow up with customers on a recurring basis. As I mentioned in the previous point about lowering your customer acquisition costs by keeping track of these customers, you basically want to set intervals of time where you're rehitting these people and saying, hey, let's get this service done again, or hey, here's a special offer, whatever the case may be. Because like I said, you don't want to have to spend more money or spend more energy to acquire new customers. We want to just reservice our existing customers. So this is something that's going to be in quote IQ very soon is the ability to email text automation with these customers so that we can stay in front of them year round and you don't even have to think about it last thing is you want to try to get into subdivisions facebook groups whenever i first started i would pass out flyers i'd land one job i'd do a great job for that customer i'd say hey would you mind posting me in the facebook group they take a screenshot of my flyer they throw it in the facebook group and before i know it i would get eight other houses in the group it's incredibly amazing what social proof and good word of mouth can do for your business so that's another one of my little bonus tips if you land a job Job, try to get in the Facebook group because that's going to get you a bunch more jobs. So if you made it this far in the video, comment down below. I'm ready because you are ready to start your business. I appreciate anybody who watched this far in the video. If you comment that down below, I'll hashtag you a real one. My name is Justin. This is Forever Self Employed. I'll leave links for everything that we talked about in today's video down below. Tons of resources down there for you guys. But until next time, hustle hard and get that money, baby. Peace.